8. Karenin did not see anything peculiar or improper in his wife's conversation, animatedly with Vronsky at a separate table. But he noticed that others in the drawing room considered it peculiar and improper. Therefore, he also considered it improper, and decided to speak to his wife about it. When he reached home, he went to his study as usual, seated himself in his easy chair, and opened a book on the papacy at the place where his paper knife was inserted. He read till one o'clock as was his wont, only now and then rubbing his high forehead and jerking his head as if driving something away. At the usual hour, he rose and prepared for bed. Anna had not yet returned. With a book under his arm, he went upstairs. But tonight, instead of his usual thoughts and calculations about his official affairs, his mind was full of his wife and of something unpleasant that had happened concerning her. Contrary to his habit, he did not go to bed, but with his hands clasped behind his back, started pacing up and down the rooms. He felt that he could not lie down till he had thought over these newly arisen circumstances. When Karenin had decided to talk the matter over with his wife, it had seemed to him quite easy and simple to do so. But now, when he began considering how to approach her, the matter appeared very difficult and complicated. He was not of a jealous disposition. Jealousy, in his opinion, insulted a wife, and a man should have confidence in his wife. Why he should have confidence, that is, a full conviction that his young wife would always love him, he never asked himself. But he felt no distrust, and therefore had confidence, and assured himself that it was right to have it. Now, though his conviction that jealousy is a shameful feeling, and that one ought to have confidence, had not been destroyed, he felt that he was face to face with something illogical and stupid, and he did not know what to do. Karanin was being confronted with life, with the possibility of his wife's loving somebody else, and this seemed stupid and incomprehensible to him, because it was life itself. He had lived and worked all his days in official spheres which deal with the reflections of life, and every time he had knocked up against life itself, he had stepped out of its way. He now experienced a sensation such as a man might feel who, while quietly crossing a bridge over an abyss, suddenly sees that the bridge is being taken to pieces and that he is facing the abyss. The abyss was real life. The bridge was the artificial life Karanin had been living. It was the first time that the possibility of his wife's falling in love with anybody had occurred to him, and he was horrified. He did not undress, but paced up and down with his even step on the resounding parquet floor of the dining room which was lit by one lamp, over the carpet of the dark drawing room, where a light was reflected only from a recently painted portrait of himself, which hung above the sofa, and on through her sitting room, where two candles were burning, lighting up the portraits of her relatives and friends, and the elegant knick-knacks, long familiar to him, on her writing table. Through her room, he reached the door of their bedroom, and then turned back again. From time to time he stopped, generally on the parquet floor of the lamp-lit dining room, and thought, yes, it is necessary to decide and to stop it, to express my opinion of it and my decision. Then he had turned back again. But express what? What decision? He asked himself in the drawing room, and could find no answer. But after all, he reflected before turning into a room, what is it that has happened? Nothing at all. She had a long talk with him. Well, what of that? Are there not plenty of men with whom a woman may talk? Besides, to be jealous is to degrade myself and her, he said to himself as he entered her sitting room. But that consideration which formerly had weighed so much with him, now had neither weight nor meaning. At the bedroom door he turned back, and as soon as he re-entered the dark drawing room, a voice seemed to whisper that it was not so and that if others noticed, that showed that there must have been something for them to notice. And again he repeated to himself in the dining room, Yes, it is necessary to decide and stop it, and express my opinion. And again in the drawing room, at the turn into her room, he asked himself, Decide what? And then, What has happened? And he replied, Nothing. And remember that jealousy is a feeling which insults a wife. But in the drawing room he came again to the conviction that something had happened. His mind as well as his body performed a complete circle each time without arriving at anything new. He noticed this, rubbed his forehead, and sat down in a room. Here, as he looked at her table, 
at the malachite cover of her blotting book and an unfinished letter that lay there. His thoughts suddenly underwent a change. He began thinking about her, of what she thought and felt. For the first time he vividly pictured to himself her personal life, her thoughts, her wishes. But the idea that she might and should have her own independent life appeared to him so dreadful that he hastened to drive it away. That was the abyss into which he feared to look. To put himself in thought and feeling into another being was a mental action foreign to Karenin. He considered such mental acts to be injurious and dangerous romancing. And what is most terrible of all, thought he, is that, just now, when my work is coming to completion, he was thinking of the project he was then carrying through, when I need peace and all my powers of mind, just now this stupid anxiety falls on me. But what is to be done? I am not one of those who suffer anxiety and agitation, and have not the courage to look them in the face. I must think it over, come to a decision, and throw it off, he said aloud. The question of her feelings, of what has taken place or may take place in her soul, is not my business. It is the business of her conscience and belongs to religion, said he, feeling relieved at having found the formal category to which newly arisen circumstances rightly belonged. Well then, thought he, the question of her feelings and so on are questions of her conscience, which cannot concern me. My duty is clearly defined. As head of the family, I am the person whose duty is to guide her, and who is therefore partly responsible. I must show her the danger which I see, warn her, and even use my authority. I must speak plainly to her. What he would say to his wife took clear shape in Karenin's head. Thinking it over, he regretted having to expend his time and powers of mind on inconspicuous domestic affairs. But nevertheless, clearly and definitely, as though it were an official report, the form and sequence of the speech he had to make shaped itself in his mind. I must make the following quite clear. First, the importance of public opinion and propriety. Secondly, the religious meaning of marriage. Thirdly, if necessary, I must refer to the harm that may result to our son. Fourthly, allude to her own unhappiness. And interlacing his fingers, palms downwards, he stretched them and the joints cracked. That movement, a bad habit of cracking his fingers, always tranquilized him and brought him back to that precision of mind which he now so needed. The sound of a carriage driving up to the front door was heard, and Karenin stood still in the middle of the room. A woman's steps were heard descending the stairs. Karenin, ready to deliver his speech, stood pressing his interlaced fingers together, trying whether some of them would not crack again. One of the joints did crack. By the sound of a light step on the stair, he was aware of her approach, and, though he was satisfied with his speech, he felt some apprehension of the coming explanations. 9. Anna walked in with bowed head, playing with the tassels of her hood. Her face shone with a vivid glow, but it was not a joyous glow. It resembled the terrible glow of a conflagration on a dark night. On seeing her husband, she lifted her head and, as if awakening from sleep, smiled. "'You're not in bed? What a wonder!' she said, throwing off her hood, and without pausing she went on to her dressing room. "'Alexis Alexandrovich, it's high time,' she added from beyond the door. "'Anna, I must have a talk with you.' "'With me?' she said with surprise, coming back from the other room and looking at him. "'What is it? What about?' she asked, seating herself. "'Well, let us have a talk, if it's so important. "'But it would be better to go to bed.' "'Anna said what came into her head, "'and hearing her own words was astonished at her capacity for deception. "'How simple and natural her words sounded, "'and how really it seemed as if she were merely sleepy. "'She felt herself clothed in an impenetrable armour of lies.' and that some unseen power was helping and supporting her. Anna, I must warn you, said he. Warn me, she asked. What about? She looked so naturally and gaily at him, that one who did not know her as her husband did, could not have noticed anything strange in the intonation of the meaning of her words. But for him, who knew her, 
knew that when he went to bed five minutes late, she noticed it and asked the reason. Knew that she had always immediately told him all her joys, pleasures and sorrows. For him, her reluctance to notice his state of mind, or to say a word about herself, meant much. He saw that the depths of her soul, till now always open, were close to him. More than that, he knew from her tone that she was not ashamed of this, but seemed to be saying frankly, Yes, it is closed, and so it should be, and will be in future. He now felt like a man who on coming home finds his house locked against him. But perhaps the key can still be found, thought Karenin. I wish to warn you, he said in low tones, that you may, by indiscretion and carelessness, give the world occasion to talk about you. Your too animated conversation tonight with Count Fronsky, he pronounced the name firmly and with quiet deliberation, attracted attention. As he spoke, he looked at her laughing eyes, terrible to him now in their impenetrability, and felt the uselessness and idleness of his words. You're always like that, she replied, as if not understanding him at all, and intentionally taking notice only of his last words. One day you dislike my being dull, another day my being happy. I was not dull. Does that offend you? Karenin started and bent his head to crack his fingers. Ah! Please don't crack your fingers. I dislike it so, she said. Anna, is this you? said he softly, making an effort and refraining from moving his hands. But whatever is the matter, she asked in a tone of comical surprise and sincerity, what do you want of me? Karani paused and rubbed his forehead and eyes. He felt that instead of doing what he had meant to do, and warning his wife that she was making a mistake in the eyes of the world, he was involuntarily getting excited about a matter which concerned her conscience, and was struggling against some barrier of his imagination. This is what I intended to say, he continued coldly and calmly, and I ask you to listen to me. As you know, I consider jealousy an insulting and degrading feeling, and will never allow myself to be guided by it. But there are certain laws of propriety which one cannot disregard with impunity. I did not notice it this evening, but, judging by the impression created, all present noticed that you behaved and acted not quite as was desirable. Really, I don't understand at all, said Anna, shrugging her shoulders. It is all the same to him, she said to herself, but society noticed, and that disturbed him. You are not well, Alexis Alexandrovich, she added, rose and was about to pass out of the room but he moved forward as if wishing to stop her. His face looked plainer and gloomier than she had ever yet seen it. Anna stopped and, throwing back her head and bending it to one side, she began with her quick hands to take out her hairpins. Well, I'm listening. What next? said she quietly and mockingly. I'm even listening with interest because I should like to understand what it is all about. As she spoke, she wondered at her quietly natural tone, and had her correct choice of words. I have not the right to inquire into all the details of your feelings, and in general, I consider it useless and even harmful to do so, began Karenin. By digging into our souls, we often dig up what might better have remained there unnoticed. Your feelings concern your own conscience, but it is my duty to you, to myself, and to God, to point out to you your duties. Our lives are bound together not by man, but by God. This bond can only be broken by a crime, and that kind of crime brings its punishment. I don't understand anything. Oh dear, and as the luck will have it, I'm dreadfully sleepy, said she, while with deaf fingers she felt for the remaining pins in her hair. Anna, for God's sake don't talk like that, he said mildly. Perhaps I'm mistaken, but believe me, that what I am saying I say equally for my own sake and for yours. I am your husband, and I love you. For an instant her head had drooped and the mocking spark in her eyes had died away. But the word love aroused her again. Love, she thought, as if he can love. If he had never heard people talk of love, he would never have wanted that word. He does not know what love is. Alexis Alexandrovich, I really do not understand, she replied. Explain what you consider. Allow me to finish. 
I love you, but I'm not talking of myself. The chief person's concern are our son and yourself. I repeat, perhaps my words may seem quite superfluous to you. Perhaps they result from a mistake of mine. In that case, I ask your pardon. But if you feel that there are any grounds, however slight, I beg you to reflect. And if your heart prompts you to tell me, Karenin did not notice that he was saying something quite different from what he had prepared. I have nothing to say. Besides, she added, rapidly, and hardly repressing a smile, it really is bedtime. Karenin sighed, and without saying anything more, went into the bedroom. When she went there, he was already in bed. His lips were sternly compressed and his eyes did not look at her. Anna got into her bed, and every moment expected that he would address her. She was afraid of what he would say, and yet wished to hear it, but he remained silent. She lay waiting and motionless for a long time, and then forgot him. She was thinking of another. She saw him, and felt her heart fill with excitement and guilty joy at the thought. Suddenly she heard an even, quiet, nasal sound like whistling. For a moment, the sound he emitted seemed to have startled Karanin, and he stopped. But, after he had breathed twice, the whistling recommenced with fresh and calm regularity. It's late, it's late, she whispered to herself and smiled. For a long time she lay still with wide open eyes, the brightness of which, it seemed to her, she could herself see in the darkness. 10. From that time, a new life began for Karenin and his wife. Nothing particular happened. Anna went into society as before, frequently visiting the Princess Betsy, and she met Vronsky everywhere. Karenin noticed this, but could do nothing. She met all his efforts to bring about an explanation by presenting an impenetrable wall of married perplexity. Externally, things seemed as before, but their intimate relations with one another were completely changed. Karenin, strong as he was in his official activities, felt himself powerless here. Like an ox, he waited submissively with bowed head for the pole-axe which he felt was raised above him. Each time he began to think about it, he felt that he must try again. That by kindness, tenderness and persuasion, there was still a hope of saving her and obliging her to bethink herself. Every day he prepared himself to have a talk with her. But each time he began to speak with her, he felt the same spirit of evil and falsehood which had taken possession of her master him also. And he neither said the things he meant to, nor spoke in the tone he had meant to adopt. He spoke involuntarily in his habitual half-bantering tone, which seemed to make fun of those who said such things seriously. And in that tone, it was impossible to say what had to be said to her. 11. That, which for nearly a year had been Vronsky's sole and exclusive desire, supplanting all his former desires, that which for Anna had been an impossible, dreadful, but all the more bewitching dream of happiness, had come to pass. Pale, with trembling lower jaw, he stood over her, entreating her to be calm, himself not knowing why or how. Anna, Anna, he said in trembling voice, Anna, for God's sake. But the louder he spoke, the lower she drooped her once proud, bright, but now dishonoured head, and she writhed, slipping down from the sofa on which she sat to the floor at his feet. She would have fallen on the carpet if he had not held her. My God, forgive me, she said, sobbing and pressing Vronsky's hand to her breast. She felt so guilty, so much to blame, that it only remained for her to humble herself and ask to be forgiven. But she had no one in the world now except him, so that even her prayer for forgiveness was addressed to him. Looking at him, she felt her degradation physically and could say nothing more. He felt what a murderer must feel when looking at the body as deprived of life. The body had deprived of life was their love, the first period of their love. There was something frightful and revolting in the recollection of what had been paid for with this terrible price of shame. The shame she felt at her spiritual nakedness communicated itself to him. But in spite of the murderer's horror of the body of his victim, that body must be cut in pieces and hidden away, and he must make use of what he has obtained by the murder. Then, as the murderer desperately throws himself on the body, 
as though with passion, and drags it and hacks it, so Vronsky covered her face and shoulders with kisses. She held his hand and did not move. Yes, these kisses were what had been bought by their shame. Yes, and this hand, which will always be mine, is the hand of my accomplice. She lifted his hand and kissed it. He knelt down and tried to see her face, but she hid it and did not speak. At last, as though mastering herself, she sat up and pushed him away. Her face was as beautiful as ever, but all the more piteous. It's all over, she said. I have nothing but you left. Remember that. I cannot help remembering what is life itself to me. For one moment of that bliss. What bliss? She said with disgust and horror, and the horror was involuntarily communicated to him. For heaven's sake, not another word. She rose quickly and moved away from him. Not another word, she repeated, and with a look of cold despair, strange to him, she left him. She felt that at that moment she could not express in words her feeling of shame, joy and horror at this entrance on a new life. And she didn't wish to vulgarize that feeling by inadequate words. Later on, the next day and the next, she still could not find words to describe all the complexity of those feelings, and could not even find thoughts with which to reflect on all that was in her soul. She said to herself, No, I can't think about it now. Later, when I'm calmer. But that calm, necessary for reflection, never came. Every time the thought of what she had done, and of what was to become of her, and of what she should do, came to her mind, she was seized with horror, and drove these thoughts away. Not now. Later, when I'm calmer, she said to herself. But in her dreams, when she had no control over her thoughts, her position appeared to her in all its shocking nakedness. One dream she had almost every night. She dreamt that both at once were her husbands, and lavished their caresses on her. Alexis Alexandrovitch wept, kissing her hands, saying, How beautiful it is now! And Alexis Vronsky was there too, and he also was her husband. And she was surprised that formerly this had seemed impossible to her, and laughingly explained to them how much simpler it really was, and that they were both now contented and happy. But this dream weighed on her like a nightmare, and she woke from it filled with horror.